Well, hello. Ah. Note to self, put on microphone before starting to talk. Yeah, there we go. How you doing? <laughs> you know what will really wear you out? Like if I was on the phone with uh, like some really ignorant people today. And they are like an energy vampire. They are like a black hole of misery talking to like people. There's a sign I keep wanting to make and like hanging behind my head to send it as a subliminal message to the whole world. And uh, it is this. Just do your job. Nobody wants to do their job anymore. Yeah, you encountering some of the same things I am? I know you are because you tell me that you are. Um, I worked actually uh, diligently on this video and I think I've simplified it after all these years making things simple and people still saying it's complicated to the deeper, deepest, deepest secrets and mysteries of magnetism. I can't cover incommensurability in this video because there's only so many different ways you can simplify that. But I can actually make magnetism very simple and easy to understand. I'm going to accomplish that in this video. I am going to accomplish it. So, by the way, uh, in the description below, if you ever like any of my videos, and I've got like over 8,000, any donation is always warmly welcome because I'm not selling anything other than like leather goods, but that's a lot of hard work. I've even got a cut of my finger right here from doing some leather work, so any donation is always uh, warmly welcome. I keep getting shocked, not literally shocked, by people keep saying, oh, you're not the person that figured out magnetism. Tesla figured that out uh, first. Really? I have every book ever written on magnetism, including everything Tesla said on the topic, and he's never explained it, and neither has anybody else. QED, Richard Feynman, none of these people have explained what magnetism is. I'm not actually boasting before getting onto this video when I say this that, uh, you know, if I were to drop tomorrow, I at least feel proud of the fact that I've accomplished more than just that in life, but I am proud to be the first uh, uh, human being, not that any other animal figured it out, first human being to actually figure out what magnetism is, why it is, how it is, why it works, and... Uh, I've spent more time, deeper time, and sharp time. By sharp, I mean, you know, pinpointed uh, focus of mind. The ancient Pali word for that is kind of highly accurate. It's called ikagachitasa, which basically means needle pinpoint attention to trying to figure this out, and I have. Um, I'd like to make a few analogies, too, and i got a couple magnets over here, including this is the one and only time that I know of where pyramid power is actually real. I'm going to use this as an analogy. And I got a couple of ring magnets, but they're attached to some metal devices over there, so I got a couple images here. I can't get them peeled off the metal metal devices that they're on over there. I'm using them to hold some um, sewing equipment where pyramid power is actually real and actually use this as an analogy. Um, qualitative versus quantitative. Most people, I think, kind of understand that. Say you actually have somebody, and I'm using this analogy to explain magnetism. I'm going to use a few and then I'm going to make uh, magnetism understandable for absolutely anybody. I don't care if you didn't graduate elementary school. It will be abundantly clear and obvious what I'm talking about. And you'll actually have a clear picture of what uh, the magnetic field is. Um, qualitative issues. Say you have uh, a person that you know in your entire life. You know, they have friends and brothers and sisters or whatnot, and they get into a really bad car wreck. Yeah? Everything is fine except, uh, for example, they, you know, might have incurred some sort of really serious head trauma in the car wreck. Now, they are quantitatively identical after the car wreck as they were before. Yeah? The only thing that's actually changed is the quality. So their DNA is the same. They weigh the same. They look the same. Um, they don't act the same anymore. But everything about their, their DNA is the same. Everything about them is quantitatively 100% identical. The only thing that's actually changed is the quality of who they are. They can't remember their own name, for example. And, of course, there are many examples of this. You know, they can't recognize their own mother and father, or brother or sister, and they might have spent countless years in, uh, getting a postgraduate degree, but they can't remember any of it. They know simple things, and they understand simple language, but they're qualitatively 100% uh, different than they were uh, before the wreck. 
When we actually define what a magnet is, it is quantitatively identical before it becomes a magnet as it is after, but the quality has changed. It is now a point source object. People actually confuse magnet with magnetism, that thing that we actually call the magnet. Before this was turned into, man, it's a really powerful magnet too, by the way. It's wanting to jump towards this metal sewing machine back here, and I just moved it a, about an inch, and it wanted to jump towards that, and I had to grab it over here. I don't know if you could see me grabbing it outside of the, the frame. Is this. It was quantitatively identical before it was turned, and it's made out of two pieces, and the reason why, and it's conjoined afterwards, is that you can actually only magnetize something so deeply. To actually magnetize this as a single object is really quite difficult, so you magnetize the two objects separately, you put them together, and then they act in unison, of course. So, quantitatively it was the same before it became a magnet, but now it is a magnet, and I'm trying to get it too close to my iPad or my computer. It's absolutely identical. So that which actually defines a magnet is qualitative, not quantitative. Yeah, Same distinction between a 60-watt light bulb and a 60-watt laser. They're both 60 watts. They're drawing the same amount of power, but one is really dangerous and will burn a hole in the back of your... You know, your retina, for example, and uh, the other one is pretty useless to even read by. 5-watt laser versus a 5-watt light bulb. Doesn't have to be 60. 60 watts is actually incredibly powerful, incredibly dangerous. Here's another analogy, and this helps people understand things better. You know, you're in taking a shower. You have the shower head, of course, and then you have uh, the sink or the drain. Of course, in, the, in a wash basin, we actually have the sink with a hole in the bottom, but there's a sink, of course, at your feet, and that, of course, is the drain in the shower. Now, a magnet doesn't work exactly this way, but it makes the analogy really simple for people to wrap their brain around. You know, when you increase the pressure on uh, the shower head, which, of course, interests people, they need to know the temperature and how much pressure to apply. And, of course, your bathtub, your uh, shower stall, doesn't work this way. When you increase the pressure at uh, the shower stall, you're vastly increasing, um, and I'm going to explain this very shortly here with another analogy, another analogy um, the vacuum pressure, which is a negative pressure at the drain. Once again, of course, your shower doesn't work that way, but a magnet actually does. I can actually show that to you. I don't know if you can see it. I hopefully you can. This is just simplex magnetic viewing film. I don't need the supercell to show this. But you can see here at the base of the pyramid, it's actually curved towards the tip. This is no different than a fireman's uh, nozzle, which is actually shaped slightly pyramidally. And the reason for that, it vastly increases the pressure. You can actually see that warped curved line here at the base of the pyramid, how it's warped towards the tip. And I'll explain that in a second. And of course, up here, we actually have incredibly strong magnetic flux. But in doing so, since we've increased the pressure at the shower head, we've vastly increased the negative pressure, the vacuum pressure, because magnetism is a dielectric field. To say magnetism versus dielectricity is like saying ice versus water. Both are water, but one is a different quality of water, of course, cold water, which is hard and it's solid and it has different attributes, but it's still water, right? In increasing vastly the pressure up here, and it is really very powerful. You actually take a, a Gauss meter and you probe it right here at the tip. It has extremely high magnetic flux. But in doing so, we've also too greatly increased the pressure down here. That, that bow or curvature towards the tip at the base of the pyramid right down here, you could actually see as it's curved up this way, it's curving towards the tip. Is that since we increase the pressure up here, the drain, and once again, your shower doesn't work this way. What if you were able to turn the pressure up so high on your shower head, just like at the tip of this pyramidal magnet, that the drain at your feet in the shower stall were to start making a, a sucking sound and it got larger. <laughs> you can actually see this of really powerful magnets underneath the supercell. Uh, the actual black spot in the center is a lot larger. And of course, your shower doesn't work that way, but analogously, this is the correct understanding of things. You have this uh, conjoined twin pair of conjugate fields, which are one and the same thing. And all fields, of course, are ether perturbation modalities. Magnetism is a dielectric field and loss of energy or inertia. In the case of the shower analogy, nobody cares about the drain, unless it's not draining, of course. In the case of our dielectric hole or our increasing inertia and acceleration towards counter space, what, 
In the shower analogy, nobody's concerned about the drain, the drain hole. They're only interested in the shower head and, you know, how fancy the shower head is and the temperature and all other things. You know, one move, of course, is due to pressure and force that is out of the shower head, and the other move, of course, is inertia and rest. The drain of the water, of course, in your shower is uh, due to gravity, but the actual flowing towards uh, counter space, and there is a hole on either end of a magnet. Of course, a magnet doesn't actually have poles. It has the inverse of counter space. There's a super tiny hole right here, but it's not enough to compensate for the high magnetic flux. So the lowest pressure mediation for the dissipation of that is this big hole right here at the bottom. And that's why it's uh, so great, the negative pressure of the magnetic field. You can actually see that curved uh, flux line at the base there, where the actual magnetism here is causing an enlargement and an elongation of the actual uh, dielectric portal, or you can say countersink or counter space or zero point at the base of that pyramidal magnet. Let's get on to the lines of force. There are no magnetic lines of force. These are, of course, not lines. These lines of force, presumed by everybody, are pertaining to, magnet, uh, pertaining to magnetism is just simplex constructive or destructive interference. It's kind of like interweaving traffic. Of course, we don't have traffic like that in most places, but like on a one-lane road where traffic is going one way and it's coming the other way, say there's an enormous amount of traffic, and it's the traffic of one going the one way and the other one going the opposite way. One's going towards force and motion, and the other one's going towards inertia and acceleration. You either have mutual destruction or mutual interference. The interference, of course, is between inertia and force are saying the interference between the dielectric and magnetism. Magnetism is the field modality of the loss of energy or inertia of the dielectric that we call force. It's the toroidal geometry that defines magnetism. The other pattern going the other way, of course, is towards inertia and acceleration. So you have this traffic that's actually fighting against each other. So all these lines and the same thing in the dual slit experiment, the same thing you see underneath the ferro cell, is the mutually assured destruction and constructive and destructive interference between the interweaving traffic, if you will, between the magnetic and the dielectric. It's either constructive interference or it's destructive interference. But these lines, and they're not lines at all, the only reason we see these lines is we see mutually assured destruction and mutually assured construction. And these negative spaces between the two where they're interweaving between each other because they are both one and the same thing. The, uh, the field of water, for example, is flowing in one direction, and this would, of course, be the geometry of the field of water relative to the dielectric, the hyperboloid, and the field of ice, analogously, of course, which would be the field of uh, magnetism, the centrifugal force and motion divergent field of the, di I mean, of the dielectric field and loss of its energy or inertia. When we talk about polarity, once again, a magnet doesn't actually have poles. This is the three-dimensional force vector, the simplex uh, shower and drain analogy. Now, the shower and drain, of course, is uh, the release of that water and, of course, the dissipation of that water. Nobody ever thinks of these two things, and they really aren't in our perfect shower, and shower analogy. You, know, you can't have an endless shower and no drain. You know, eventually your bathtub's going to fill up or your shower stall is going to overflow and nobody wants that. So you get to put in a shower, drain, shower head, you get to put in a shower drain. And the shower drain doesn't serve any purpose relative to the shower head. So these two are working in conjunction. One is for force dissipation of the water and the other one is for draining the water. And this is what exists on either side of any magnet. But a magnet doesn't have poles. It has the inverse of counter space, this three-dimensional force and motion um, of inverse of counter space. And of course, the inverse of this hyperboloid or this hourglass shape, which is the geometry of dielectricity, is the torus. We look at this end of the hourglass, this would be the whole of the dielectric, which is an increasing inertia and acceleration towards counter space. And our perfect analogy, the energy would be actually terminating right here rather than the sand flowing from one side to the other and back and forth. Can't take that analogy, of course, too far. In the case of the pyramid, as I've talked about, you actually have the centrifugal flux, which is incredibly shallow. The amazing thing about these, and nobody answers these questions, I'm the only person on Earth that has answered that. It's like, why is it so shallow? You have incredibly powerful magnetic flux right here, and if you actually get it near your lips or your nose, you could feel it 
Trust me, I've told people to do that, and people are like, oh, yeah, I didn't believe you. I tried it. You're right. I ordered a pyramidal magnet. There's only a couple places you could buy these from. The reason why it's so shallow up here, just like the fireman's nozzle, is the pressure doesn't last very far past the tip. It's really shallow. It's only like less than two millimeters of incredibly powerful magnetic flux. The more you increase it here, the more you increase the drain pressure. That's why the magnetic flux isn't like, well, it's so powerful, it must extend out really, really far. Kind of like a fireman's nozzle. Because a fireman's nozzle is pyramidal shaped to get that water pressure up into a tall building to put out a fire. Yeah, but in this, this case, our fireman's nozzle, which is magnetic flux here, the back end of the nozzle, like our shower analogy, which doesn't work that way, and our fireman's hose analogy, uh, fireman's uh, hose nozzle analogy doesn't work that way. There's actually increasing uh, force uh, pressure dissipation where the water is, uh, has a negative pressure or vacuum pressure at the back end of uh, the magnet. And, of course, each side is exactly identical. This is the one example where pyramid power is actually real. Let me make a quote from... Uh, Charles Proteus Steinmetz, in electrical circuits containing energy stored in the magnetic and the dielectric field, which are both one thing, not two. This is ice and water, not two different things. Well, we have a, a separate word for ice and a separate word for water, but anybody with five brain cells know that ice and water is the same thing. Getting back to a quote from uh, C.P. Steinmetz, in electrical circuits containing energy stored in the magnetic and the dielectric, the change in the amount of stored energy occurs by a series of changes from the magnetic to the dielectric and back again from the dielectric to the magnetic and stored energy. He doesn't explain why. Neither Steinmetz nor Tesla nor any of these people, up until, my, up until me, and I don't care if you think I'm boasting or not, has actually ever explained why magnetism is, how it magnetism is, but they've made some correct observations. This is another one from C.P. Steinmetz. Many textbooks speak of the electrical charges on the conductor and energy stored by them without the consideration that the dielectric energy is not on the surface of the conductor but in the space outside of the conductor. He meant to say actually the space around the conductor because space is not a, uh, a placeholder for any field. It's never the terminator for any field either. Terminator for any field is counter space, never space. No energy ever terminates or grounds in space. Space is the opposite of a ground. Yeah? When we say ground, it's just a fancy word for, um, uh, for counter space, by the way. Anytime someone talks about an electrical ground, you could substitute that for counter space. You could substitute counter space for the word ground. Not on the surface, but outside of the conductor, just as also is magnetic energy. Hmm? Getting back uh, to uh, polarity, too, I like to use this. Uh, they used to show this at Ripley's, believe it or not. It's uh, suspended in free air. It's made out of styrofoam. It's really lightweight, for example. It's this uh, faucet that's perpetually pouring water, and people ask the question, well, where is the water coming from? You know, you see this, uh, and it's literally, there's nothing behind it back here. You know, it's not being fed with water back where you would think it is, and that's the the uh, visual trick, if you will, what actually is happening, there's a hollow, clear tube up the middle of it, right here, where the water is being pumped back up to the shower head and draining out. So, one is invisible. Everybody's fascinated by the falling water out of this, uh, shower, uh, this shower faucet, which is a magic shower faucet. It's just a visual trick. It's a magician's trick. Um, but what they can't see is that there's a clear plastic hollow tube that's not only holding up that faucet, which is not really a faucet, but it's pumping the water up and then it's flowing out around the top of the tube and pouring back out again. So that, that's nearly a perfect analogy of the magnetic field. Everybody's fascinated by the flowing water, just as everybody's fascinated by the magnetic flux on any magnet. But what they can't see is what's powering that water. Yeah? right up the middle of it, and right in the middle of any torus is the hyperboloid. Yeah, kind of a near-perfect analogy, by the way. There is no such thing as magnetism applied in the autonomous field modality in people's mind, wherein magnetism observes as there is a necessitated conjugate presence between the magnetic and the dielectric. This idea of uh, magnetic attraction or, uh, you know, magnets accelerate uh, each other and therefore that is due to magnetism is a fallacy of composition. You know, it doesn't go, you know, well, 
Two magnets are accelerating towards one another, therefore that acceleration, we will call it magnetic attraction, therefore it's due to magnetism. That's not the case. That's a correct observation, but an incorrect conclusion. Uh, quantum and relativity is extremely uh, guilty of this. Magnetism, of course, is the dielectric field. Magnetism, of course, represents that fundamental force and toroidal field modality as expressed by the loss of energy or inertia. If you want a perfect chicken and egg analogy, and everybody's been saying that since the dawn of time, you know, which came uh, first, the chicken or the egg? If you want a, a near-perfect chicken and egg analogy relative to magnetism, dielectricity, and whatnot, is that the dielectric would be the chicken sitting on the eggs uh, in the coop, you know, at rest, right? And magnetism would be the chicken running around the coop, yeah? the toroidal running around the cube. And the ether, or counterspace, or rest energy, or inertia, take your pick, counterspace, ether, rest, inertia, these are all references to one and the same thing, would be the egg itself, because the egg itself represents, obviously, not only the egg, which it is the egg, but of course the chicken, because the egg is an unrealized chicken. Yeah? If it's hatched, obviously, so, yeah? So, the dielectric would be the chicken sitting on the eggs. Magnetism would be the same chicken running around the coop. I don't know, chasing, you know, chasing something to eat. I don't know what. And uh, the ether would be the egg itself, which represents rest, which represents potential. Yeah, brought to fruition, the release of that energy. Of course, we have the chicken. Yeah. Perfect analogy. Nearly perfect analogy. Once again, magnetic attraction does not exist any way, shape, or form. A magnet doesn't have a magnetic field around it either. Sure it does. Sure around this magnet right here is a magnetic field. There is, but that's not being emitted by the magnet. Observationally, just as the idea of magnetic attraction exists, we would think that, uh, just as we think... Ignorantly and incorrectly that uh, a light bulb emits light. It doesn't. It sets up a field perturbation modality. Nothing emits sound. A sound is a perturbation of the medium, that being oxygen and nitrogen. In the case of the ring magnet, you know, and there's a couple stuck over there, there's nothing in the middle, yet we see the exact same pattern as we do on any physical magnet underneath uh, the ferro cell. Here's a an image of a ring magnet. The black, big black ring around it, of course, is the physical ring magnet. But right here in the center is the exact same thing we see of any cube magnet or cylinder magnet. So we see the exact same pattern where nothing is, but that nothing is the field and disturbance. Just as sound is not an emission, sound is a disturbance of a medium. Light is a disturbance of a medium. The magnetic field is a disturbance of the medium. The magnet is a point source object with a qualitative difference. Well, in the center of that ring magnet, there's nothing there. Looking at the ring magnet through the supercell, we have the exact same pattern in the central void as we do on any cube or any magnet. The field geometry is not in or of the magnet, but of the field itself, because all fields are ether perturbation modalities. Magnet is not emitting magnetism. Nothing emits sound, we're setting up a disturbance in the air. Nothing emits light, nothing emits sound, and the so-called erroneous but correct observation that any and all magnets are emitting magnetism is wrong. We can observationally declare that that's true, but it is declaratively and demonstrably and palpably untrue. Humanity is very shallow minds. I can't really think sharply or deeply. Nikola Tesla talked about this. Magnetic attraction. I hope I simplified these things. By the way, Nikola Tesla, of all his countless inventions, said, here, like his, uh, meaning Edison lamp, my induction motor may be discarded and forgotten in the continuous evolution of the electric motor, but uh, the rotating magnetic field with all its marvelous uh, phenomenon, manifestations of force, i.e. magnetism, will last as long as science itself. That's a quote from Nikola Tesla. In other words, of all the things he invented, he was asked, what are you most proud of of all your inventions? And it, he said, he never wrote about this. He never, ever explained magnetism in any book. I've dared countless people over many years. You know, go find it. 
You're not the first person to uncover what magnetism truly is. Like, yeah, I am, unless you can go find a quote from somebody else, and it doesn't exist. I've been through all those materials countless times. There are little nuggets here and there of uh, revelational information, like the conjugate geometry between the magnetic and the dielectric. Or, and on that same note, like Dollard said, there's no way you can understand uh, electrical theory without understanding counter space. I think he actually said you can never understand electricity uh, without understanding counter space. And this is completely true. It's like you can never understand a shower system without understanding drainage. Yeah? That drain in the bottom of your shower, because you can't have a merely a shower head. It's got to go somewhere to drain. There's no way you can understand setting up ham radio equipment without a great. You can have the most, and I'm a former ham radio operator, you know, the most expensive equipment on earth, but unless it is grounded, and ground, once again, is a fancy word for saying counters, but you got bupkis. It'll work, but not so good. Most expensive, got to be grounded. There's nobody that can understand electrical theory. And basically, Steinmetz said that as well. Electricity is the conjugate between magnetism and dielectricity. Nobody could understand. And the, ma the electrical field is not in. He said this himself. This, this is a guy way more intelligent than uh, Nikola Tesla. He said uh, specifically, uh, talk about the electrical charges on the conductors and the energy stored by these conductors without considering that the dielectric energy is not on the surface of the conductor, but... Uh, uh, in the space outside of, uh, of the conductor, just as also, too, is the magnetic energy. This is from Electrical Discharges, Waves, and Impulses by Charles Proteus Steinmetz. He's basically telling you the electric field is not in the wire. You know that the electrical charge is traveling through the wire is a huge misnomer. Everybody thinks that uh, light, uh, light bulbs emit light and that my voice is emitting sound and that a magnet is emitting magnetism and that uh, electricity is traveling through the wires. All of these things are correct observations with incorrect conclusions and ultimately, demonstrably, 100% wrong. You can't understand magnetism without understanding the dielectric, and these are no different than talking about ice and water, and you can't understand any of it, one side or the other, without understanding counter space. It's just completely impossible. It's just impossible. I'm so proud that I'm the first person on earth to fully understand what magnetism is and how it is and why it is. I tried to make this very simple using some simple analogies, and I think I accomplished that. Let me know if you want to contact me. My information is in the description below. Any donations are always warmly welcome. Have a lovely day. Lux e veritas. Wisdom, by the way, is its own reward. And I don't confuse intelligence or knowledge, i.e. episteme, with wisdom. One is praiseworthy. The other one does not transcend mortality. Thanks for watching.